Hi everyone, welcome to Coastal Insights Season 3 Episode 5, Indigenous Stewardship. My name is Emily and I am casting from Squamish Territory. And my name is Arian, I'm your other co-host today, and I'm casting from the unceded territory of the Chiana Beecher Bay First Nation. All right. Um, today we are going to be talking about Indigenous stewardship. So a little bit of the background about the season. Um, this is episode five of Coastal Insights, season three, Hope, Equity, and Advocacy. This season focuses on, as the title suggests, hope, equity, and advocacy in a world changed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now a little bit about the episode. The challenges of climate change mean that decisions need to be based in science and with consideration for generations. Innovative strategies in sustainability and conservation at the forefront must come from an understanding of the wisdom of Indigenous peoples and based on a holistic worldview, connection to nature, and the experience of living off the land since time immemorial. Today we're exploring the dark history of colonialism in BC and the enduring colonial policies and systemic discrimination that are maintaining significant social inequities. We're also going to be talking to our guests about how their communities and nations are creating the foundation for change based in Indigenous ways of being. This season would not be possible without a couple of key partnerships. Uh, first, um, uh, namely between the Raincoast Conservation Foundation and Take a Stand Youth for Conservation. Raincoast is a group of humans, researchers, scientists, and conservationists based on Wasanich territory who are doing incredible work to confront the problems facing the diverse ecosystems of our province. Raincoast does this through their mission to investigate, inform, and inspire. Alongside them this season is Take a Stand, uh, an organization that um, I'm proud to be a part of. Take a Stand's goal are, goals are much like Raincoast in the principle of fostering an informed community. Um, what I really particularly appreciate about Take a Stand is their focus on motivating and empowering youth to protect the environment through art, film, and youth-driven actions. Emily, back to you. All right. So we are going to get right into the show uh, by introducing our very first guest. Very exciting to talk to this person. So we're going to be talking to Takaya Blaney, who I have personally have been a fan of since I was a wee child. Um, so this is the bio. Activist, actor, and singer-songwriter Takaya Blaney began her activism at the age of 10 when she took aim at the oil company Embridge with her song and music video, Shallow Waters. When she was 13, Takaya became the youngest person ever to have intervened at the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. She urged the forum to create an Indigenous Children's Fund to ensure the survival and well-being of we, the Indigenous children and youth, now and for the generations to come. She has spoken at United Nations conferences, environmental events, and in classrooms across Canada and internationally. Takaya is also an award-winning actress, having appeared in numerous short films, music videos, and animated shows. In 2018, she won a Leo Award for Best Lead Performance by a Female for her portrayal of the protagonist Ella in the critically acclaimed Kayak to Klemtu. Takaya uses her many talents to complete her activism as she travels across Canada and around the world to affect change as a youth ambassador who believes that the recognition of Indigenous rights is vital to the health of the planet. Welcome to Kaya. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for being here in our humble webinar. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to have you. Um, I'm going to get into the uh, questions. Uh, the first question I have for you, and let's just get straight into it, um, is that you stated that colonialism has caused climate change. Um, I saw on one of your speeches, and I thought that was awesome that you said that, and I was wondering if you could tell us more about that. Yeah, so my understanding of environmental justice or climate justice is informed by my lived experiences as a Tla'aman person, uh, the teachings that have been uh, given to me by my Kukba and Chichia um, that were bestowed upon them by their Kukba and Chichia going back forever, um, an understanding of how to 
relate to our land, uh, as well as an understanding of how our land is being disrespected, exploited, um, and, and destroyed under colonial systems that are very new to our lands. And I think to have that deep rooted perspective of um, how climate change, environmental destruction and colonialism are intertwined because those timelines all run parallel uh, between the time of my great great grandparents where we had you know, so many salmon in our rivers that our whole people could be fed for the entire year to now where we have to uh, receive um, shipments or, or beg for fishing rights from the government because of um, th the lack of life in our territories. It just becomes very clear that um, the destruction of land accompanies colonialism because colonialism needs to destroy land, <laughs> uh, needs to exploit land, needs to uh, commodify land in order to assert dominion, um, in order to assert power. And the way that I approach um, climate justice and environmental justice, um, I don't even necessarily resonate with that language as much because for me, I feel like I'm following the original instructions of how to be and, and relate to our people and our lands. And in a world where our autonomy is not um, respected, um, our land is not respected, like to live free as, as like a Kaimuch person on, on my own lands, it requires resistance against colonial and capitalist systems that um, work to extinguish our way of life. It's, it's all very closely connected. And um, I don't believe that my experience as an indigenous person in relation to the land is um, magically like separate from um, global systems that are destroying our planet. Uh, I think non-indigenous people or, you know, indigenous people globally outside of, of my corner of the world um, are, are all interconnected connected in, in these global exploitative uh, systems that create climate change and, and uh, create poverty. Um, so <laughs> I'm, we'll continue this conversation, but um, yeah, that's, I guess, my way of trying to. No, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Um, I had a question um, for viewers like myself who may not be as familiar with uh, Tla'aman territory. Could you tell us a bit more about kind of where you are in BC and um, potentially some of the land rights uh, mm -hmm. issues that you have run into in your experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I realized I didn't introduce myself. I just dove right in. But um, my name is Takaya Blini. My ancestral name is Chikajimuk, and Chikajimuk was given to me by my Kukba, uh, my grandfather, and he carries that name from his Kukba. Um, I live on my territories at um, Pishusam, Tla'aman. Um, we have been here forever. Um, our territory is located about 100 miles north of Vancouver in what uh, is colonially recognized as Powell River. Um, Powell River, or Israel Powell, who Powell River is named after, was uh, an Indian agent, essentially, who was uh, one of the architects for implementing the reserve and residential school system in BC. So I don't like to identify with my own lands by such a violent and relatively new title. Um, but growing up, I spent a lot of time in 
Squamish territories in Vancouver, um, witnessing uh, indigenous mobilization around uh, extractive economies, around the Northern Gateway Pipeline, and then this eruption of indigenous movement around Idle No More. And I think witnessing that as a very young person was um, pretty formative and empowering to see our people take up space in that way. Um, and it wasn't geared towards any particular um, issue. Like there were definitely catalysts for it, I don't know more, but I think it meant a different thing to, to everybody because it was about colonialism and it was about addressing colonialism uh, nationwide as Indigenous people. Uh, for my own territories, I grew up um, on the front lines of the modern BC treaty process. And this process is not um, widely discussed within mainstream because I find um, the, the, the conflict or trauma um, that is created within this process gets kind of like siloed off as like, oh, that's just a, that's just lateral violence. That's just an issue within your community. Like you need to address amongst your people. Um, there hasn't necessarily been a, um, you know, province or nationwide conversation about the fact that Canada is trying to uh, seed land. Canada is trying to assert and settle uh, jurisdiction and dominion over Indigenous lands that were never historically um, settled through a treaty process. And before I continue, I, I do want to say that the treated lands of Canada further over the mountains, uh, the historical like numbered treaties, that, that does not mean that their land was surrendered. Um, however, most of BC is, is untreated, meaning that there was never a process where the Canadian government got permission to be here. There is never a process in which the Canadian government actually legally proved that they could be here, um, that this land is theirs to sell to corporations, to sell to uh, real estate like investors, to sell to um, industry, to exist upon. Um, that's where the term uh, unseated, which became really popularized in BC, like emerged out of is, is um, our communities articulating that unique um, political position that we are in, uh, not having treaties being signed. And largely in response to um, the Delgamuch case, um, which I would recommend people research, um, the Canadian government decided to develop the modern treaty process out of fear that other nations would try to prove and assert their rights and title through Canadian law because the foundation of Canada's occupation in the West is incredibly precarious. Um, and if you think about colonial expansion on this continent, it's westward. Uh, and in many ways, that is this understanding of like the frontier is kind of like, and, and being the last frontier is really reflected in the, um, in the political colonial like histories that you see unfolding today, especially with these modern treaty processes. And I feel like the modern treaty process has really perfected what Canada has been trying to achieve with the treaty process from the beginning, which is theft, 
just complete theft of land, packaged as self-governance. So even though there is nothing that we've signed on to or agreed upon that states that this land is not ours, the government comes to us and says, we've stolen this land from you. Sign the dotted line, we'll give 5% back to you. But the entire process operates upon the lie that this land does not belong to us. Um, so in order for our people to engage with this lie and engage with this process, it requires a massive amount of propaganda, um, you know, that we are engaging in good faith with the government and this is like a step towards reconciliation and self-governance. That is a term that gets used a lot. And interestingly, with the topic of this episode, like indigenous stewardship, that is a term that I've seen used in relation to these modern treaty processes, which is why I think it is so important to be specific with what exactly we mean about like stewardship. Because um, growing up during like the truth and reconciliation process, like as someone who is a like child of a residential school survivor, um, I, witnessed up close how the government can co-opt and manipulate sentiments around our own sovereignty. Um, the sentiments around our own oppression and how we articulate our oppression. And um, the Canadian government finds very sneaky ways to steer that conversation that denies giving us the, the very thing that we asked for in the beginning. Um, so that's a bit of a background on modern treaties. It's, it's, a, um, it's a pretty complex thing that I could, I could keep talking about. But my family was very vocally opposed to that process. And um, it was a really difficult thing within our community um, because there was, you know, division. Um, and I've heard it articulated um, to describe the conflict that is caused when government and industry enters our community. Um, it's, it's like a state funded civil war when the government or, or a massive corporation approaches your small community that uh, exists in a state of manufactured poverty with a large amount of money are you going to say yes or say no? You guys figure it out amongst yourselves. We're going to go and we'll come back when you um, tell us like how you've made up your mind. Um, and this, and the type of like trauma that that causes with, within, you know, families and like the lateral violence, I think there's a lot of internalized shame around it because our people are told, you know, that's your problem. That's your problem that you're Indians that are fighting amongst yourselves. But it's not, it's a state funded civil war. It's, it's a deliberate strategy to like undermine um, like our family structures, like the power of like, you know, our people and, and where that power comes from. Um, when you have our people that are, you know, in poverty and then you, you dangle money over our heads um, for, you know, the purpose of colonialism, for the purpose of, of resource extraction. Um, and then tell us that it's our fault that we fight amongst each other. Um, that's just like, it's not reality. Um, and so my elders were very involved with, uh, fighting that treaty process. Um, it's, currently um like it was like ratified and and we're considered like a modern treaty nation now but i'm finding ways to address the process uh in a way to just create education around it and i think any like 
opportunity to do so, I um, I appreciate like this like webinar and you know talking to like my family members um, because I don't feel like in BC or in Canada there is any transparency or discussion around this massive process of colonialism that is happening in the West and like there's a lot of like legal technical language that is used around like modern BC treaties but like make no mistake it is about clearing up any like jurisdictional issue that might exist because of the lack of treaties uh, and creating like a, a more streamlined way for industry to come in and do what they want with their lands. Um, and, you know, like pipelines, like resource extraction, like they all follow treaties because treaties are like a mechanism for resource extraction, but also just Canada's idea of pro progress. Canada's idea of progress for Indigenous people is for us to be shareholders of resource extraction on our own homelands. And so that's what's being paved for us right now um, in many places of like the country, but in, in these specific ways in, in the West Coast. And that's what I grew up around. <laughs> um, thank you for like <clears throat> talking about that and sharing with that i mean like yeah I, growing up i think as a white person going to school we were sort of taught that well indigenous issues they happen in the past right residential school happened in the past this is something that happened in the past it is part of our history so so already kind of co-opting indigenous history and trying to weave it into the canadian narrative like this is our history but it's history like the process of colonialism is, is essentially finished. It's a tragedy. It's too bad. We know better now. Oops, right? Mm. I was wondering if you could talk um, a little bit maybe on two things. The first thing is, um, is, is like indigenous, why is, I, this sounds harsh, um, I guess, but it's like why, I know that I care. I know a lot of my friends care, but why should white people, like why, why should colonizers care? Because the way the way it's sort of seen to us is, oh, this is an indigenous issue. This is for mm -hmm. them to sort of sort out. So mm -hmm. how, why should we care and why should we be involved in, in as indigenous allies in this fight? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I feel like the way that I place myself on these lands is, you know, much different than how a settler, especially a white settler who comes from these lineages of, of colonialism and, and is a part of that legacy, how they would place themselves upon this land is of course a reflection of colonialism. But something I noticed about colonialism is it requires this kind of amnesia about your history um, where I can I can name you know my my great 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 grandparents going all the way back, and most um, white kids that I grew up with like they don't know who their great grandparents are, they don't know where they came from, or who their family was before they came to Canada, um, because they're Canadian now. And um, so it's really, I think, hard to try and translate these like culturally rooted values of thinking about future generations because I think colonialism just erases time itself. Like I think an indigenous way of existing in time is being able to go like forwards and backwards like being able to move with like your ancestors behind you and yeah. um, act with the future generations in mind. But colonialism, it's just like, it's always the present moment. It's endless consumption without any thought of consequence because it's all about the present moment. Who cares? I'm rich now. Like, um, but 
you know, the future is a real concept <laughs> and there will be a dire impacts for everybody. Um, you know, especially black, brown and indigenous people will be and, and people in the global south will be impacted by climate change like first and the worst but it's coming for everybody um and i think addressing climate change without addressing you know uh extractive capitalist economies that were rooted upon like indigenous genocide and slavery like without addressing the systems and the history of those systems that got us here in the first place we're just not going anywhere and i've spent a lot of time in these like environmentalist spaces that center whiteness and just like don't want to look at colonialism and I'm like, wow, like this is so much money. So much money goes into these spaces. So much money goes into these like conferences. Um, and it's like, it's, it's like disgusting, you know? Um, it's like, it's like making an industry off of like climate change, making an industry off of like fighting climate change, making an industry off of like, you know, how, how can this be profitable? It's like, um, yeah, I, I think being able to place yourself, like, based off of your ancestors, based off of your history, to even, like, know your history, uh, is, is really powerful, and, like, just, you know, I think on, like, a personal, like, level, like, people should, um, should take on that journey, um, because it allows you to place yourself in, like, the present moment. And it allows you to place yourself within, like, Canadian, like, colonial history. And allows you to place yourself within, okay, what can I do? Um, whether it's, like, um, redistributing, like, the material wealth of, like, my family that's been, like, generated through colonialism. Or... Um, you know, whether it's offering to share my skills that like I, um, I have that might not necessarily be held by like other people because of like just what I've been exposed to or privileges or whatever, like being able to share that, being able to help out. Um, yeah, I, but I think like, honestly, the biggest thing is being able to place yourself in history. Um, Cause I, it's like, I can tell you like it's your obligation as a white person to like um, deal with the colonial legacies, but I don't feel like that means anything to anybody um, with, you know, if they don't like understand themselves like in that whole timeline. Takaya, I'm reminded of something you said earlier about interconnectedness and I'm, I'm, wondering you know if looking to the past can help us kind of reconnect with that idea of interconnectedness and kind of how our struggles overlap with other um communities around the world mm -hmm. want to know your thoughts about that mm -hmm. yeah well i think like it's been really just like a huge privilege to have the opportunity as a young person to exist in spaces with other global communities who are resisting colonialism, resisting climate change, um, whether they align with indigenous identity or not, I think that there's so much um, commonality. Um, just, you know, on like, a, on the level of like material conditions, of like how, how we are able to survive within like systems that exploit us and, and just having that in common, or um, just having these like cultural sentiments that have been like erased by colonialism and colonial like cultures, like like still holding on to those and not being of the same place or the same like experiences necessarily or the same people. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I think that there's like so much interconnectedness, you know, like. 
there's so many um, like immigrant communities like on my territory where you could draw these these parallels of like um, you are here because Canada exploited your people um, and Canada exploits my people and Canada occupies my land and Canada occupies your land. Um, and you might not necessarily identify as indigenous, but these are like histories, these are commonalities. And I think it is really important to like connect on, on that um, basis, like especially, I don't know, for myself thinking about like, okay, how do I address the Canadian government like on my territory with like its practices? Like I can't do that in the vacuum of just my, my own land and my own struggle because Canada does this to everybody else. So like building up those alliances, building up those like relationships and sharing experiences in history, I think is really important. Thank you so much for being able to speak to that. Emily, do you have uh, maybe one or two last questions? Uh... Yeah. Um, so maybe I have like two more questions. So. And again, in referring back to your COP26 speech, you can't fight a colonialism caused problem with colonial solutions. And sort of the way I see this is just focusing on, oh, we just got to mitigate carbon. We can keep our capitalist economy as is. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we just, you know, have enough electric cars, everything's going to go back to normal. And I think what we're talking about more is a social systemic revolution. Um, mm -hmm. What would you, how if you had like control or if you were able to do what you would like to see done to the land that is known as Canada what what are some changes that you would like to make and maybe more practically what are some solutions that people and viewers can start to implement that are pushing us towards a future that we would like to see that's away from the colonial capital violence that we've all experienced um Well, I think after existing in these um, high level international spaces, such as UN forums that exist to address climate change or gather state leaders and polluters to confront like the concept of climate change is like more so what that is. Um, I've just walked away from those spaces with this like reflection of, okay, for me, that is like the highest of the high level, like the world coming together to address climate change and they accomplish nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I go back home and I spend time with my elders and my family and my community. And I just feel so much more like hope and like tangible action um, and the, the roots of something, you know, that can be grown, that can be nurtured. Like, I just, I feel so much more, um, fulfilled, uh, pouring my energy into, um, this because it's like one thing to go to these international spaces and be like land back, but it's like the, uh, another thing to just like go to your land and like, you know, um, and, and put in that work. Um, and for me, after like growing up and, and, and going to these like UN conferences, I just feel like I've stepped away with this feeling of like, okay, I guess we do need a revolution. And, um, what that looks like, like, you know, I don't know, <laughs> but, um, but I do know that Canada is unlivable and capitalism and colonialism are unlivable and they're unsustainable and they're driving us globally towards destruction and they require the extinguishment of who I am as an indigenous person. Um, resource extractive like economies will always require indigenous genocide because who we are and how we exist and our relationship to the land will always contradict their relationship to the land. 
And so I don't believe that indigenous stewardship or like land back um, and these concepts around like self-governance and sovereignty, I don't think that they can exist as their own little thing within Canada. Um, and I also just have a very deep understanding of, of how long, you know, we've been on these lands. Like we've been here an unfathomable amount of time, like longer than you can really hold or conceive of like within your brain. <laughs> Um, and Canada's been here a hundred and like 50 something years, like, um, and they're not doing a good job of keeping our lands alive. You know, they're not doing a good job of laying foundation for their future generations to survive. And so I think in my lifetime, I have been tasked with the responsibility of, of protecting what we have and um, laying foundations for future generations to, to reclaim. Um, and something that I learned uh, by just reading about like Zapatistas who are like indigenous people um, in like the Chiapas in like so-called Mexico uh, who also have done a lot of anti-colonial resistance on their lands. Um, they talk about revolution and like building lifeboats for your people. And I really resonate with that language, like building a lifeboat. Like, and we have stories where we had, you know, a great flood and that's how we survived. We tied our canoes and everything that we needed to survive in those canoes to the tops of like the mountains. Um, and that's, how I think about like the collapse of colonial and capitalist systems that feels really inevitable because there's signs of it everywhere we look. So, you know, as a people, um, I believe we need to like fight to ensure that they don't take like one more inch, but also like nurture our own and build those lifeboats so our people can outlive because we've been here for so long <laughs> we've been here for so so long and we're, we're gonna still be here um and for um you know non-indigenous peoples that come from that colonial legacy like i would encourage um you to think about what what paradigm you're operating under and whether that's a paradigm of like the present moment or whether you're thinking about your future generations um, and whether you're thinking about your ancestors. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that's really beautiful. <clears throat> the last question I was gonna ask, I think you already answered, which was about like the changing planet and what we all seem to understand is <clears throat> incoming collapse or irreversible change one way or another and how you see your communities being resilient through that and holding through that change and I think I don't know if we have too much time left but I think you um what you're saying about tying boats to the mountains and um coming together like that I think sort of helped me understand where you're where you're seeing yourself coming from with that so thank you um Arian, do we have any time or should we wrap up um I think yeah we should look towards wrapping up, but Takaya, um, for our audience viewing this uh, recorded webinar, um, where where are you going next? What are you up to? And how can we um, support the work that you're doing? Um, well, I'm just like in slamming right now. Um, I'm focusing on learning my language with my Kukba and Chichia, who are both um, first language speakers. Um, I I feel like whenever I post like um, just like asks of like uh, resources or support, it's usually through social media. So maybe that could be shared. But um, otherwise, I feel like this journey that I'm on is just like one of um, 
one of um, reclaiming like memory um, and and placing myself as we've talked about um, and you know figuring out like how to best support like land and, and people. And I, I do believe that everyone has like a place in that. Um, so yeah, whatever it means for, for anyone watching this to like to do that um, in your own way. Takaya, thank you so much uh, for coming. And I think it's so awesome. I love what you're talking about, about going to the UN meetings and going to these high forms and coming back and be like, all right, well, that didn't work. Um, yeah. And like, and, uh, sort of starting with smaller communities and building resilience is sort of the understanding I've come to as well. And hearing you talk about that is wonderful. And I think Arian and I and everyone watching wish you all the best. You're doing really mm -hmm. important work and we'll definitely post your Instagram so people can send resources there. But yeah, all our love to you um, with what you're doing. Thank you. It's really like wonderful talking with both of you. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Emily, what are we up to this Wednesday with our last episode? Oh my, oh my goodness. Let me, <laughs> the next session, I'll, I will tell you, it is, it is called sustaining hope. So guess what guys, we have a lot of challenges social collapse better believe it climate change yeah is our government doing stuff nah are we going to do stuff better believe it so yeah that's happening there are numerous and rich examples of youth leading change in our community national and international levels in this webinar which is coming up called sustaining hope the hosts will discuss the youth movement with youth movement leaders to find out what inspired them to make change and what drives them for the long haul, because this is a long haul, guys. Some positive changes from the past year will be highlighted. The hosts and guests will share their opinions on what kinds of leaders, businesses, and careers are needed most for the future. Let's let's change the system. Let's uh, revolutionize the word, world, people. So yeah, that's happening next Wednesday. Sustaining awesome. hope. Thank you for that, Emily. And for people uh, in the audience watching right now, um, particularly for students in grades three through 12, there's an opportunity for you to take action and change your community right now. Uh, we are looking to showcase the many inspiring youth-led projects that promote education, stewardship, and conservation of the local wildlife, habitats, and indigenous cultures of coastal British Columbia and the transboundary Pacific Northwest. In Raincoast's 2022 uh, Student Innovation Challenge in partnership with Take a Stand Youth for Conservation, uh, your project could be featured in our virtual event that will bring together other inspiring youths doing incredible work in their communities and a rich network of professionals working to protect and sustain nature. Again, this is for uh, students or youth uh, grades three through 12. Um, and the deadline to submit your project is May 27th. So yeah, check out, check us out at um raincoast.org backslash innovation challenge for more information but we'd love to see your submission in by may 27th uh but other than that emily thanks for our great episode uh we've been your co-hosts and this has been coastal insight season three episode five on indigenous stewardship thank you Aaron. thank you for thank you for watching everyone see ya bye